Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has also reacted to Prigozhin's relocation to Belarus following a meeting with the presidents of Poland and Lithuania. Zelensky confirmed that some Wagner fighters remained on Russian-occupied territory in the eastern Luhansk region, but he said the security situation in the north remained unchanged and under control. And with all of this going on in the background, Ukrainian forces are trying to find momentum for their recently launched counteroffensive. Despite the deliveries of Western military equipment, Ukraine's territorial gains have so far only been modest against what appear to be well-entrenched Russian defenses. For now, at least, it seems the turmoil in Moscow has not had an impact on the battlefield. There is a lot to unpack, and for that, I can now welcome Justin Quump. He's a military analyst and CEO of Sibyline, a, a consultancy firm based in the UK. Good to have you here. We've to spoken here. to you throughout the war many times uh, via video link, and it's the first time you're actually joining us here in the studio. And what a time it is to have you here to, to unpack everything that's going on, because... It has been quite an extraordinary weekend. What do you make of it? Really extraordinary. And I think you've covered the events very well in the programme. I think the big question that's outstanding, and it's very much in social media today, is a split between people, and, and I must say I'm one of these who believe that this is what it appears to have been. It was a revolt, it was a mutiny by the Wagner Group, um, probably with some support elsewhere within the system, um, and it was called off following extensive behind-the-scenes uh, debates that were going on during Saturday's chaotic behaviour. But there is another school of thought being pushed by a lot of Russia supporters. This is a, a cunning plan to draw out Putin's enemies and to manoeuvre the Wagner Group to Belarus and, and threaten Ukraine with a new front. And I think that's pretty far-fetched, but there's a lot of debate around that. And I think regardless, um, whatever has manifested is going to have a real impact on the course of events, certainly over the next few weeks, as we all try and make sense of it. Yeah, we're trying to make sense of it, and it looks like there was knowledge of what Prigozhin was planning. Yeah. So can this really solely be blamed, pinned on him as a mastermind? Well, and clearly it looks like the Russians themselves definitely aren't just pinning it on him. Um, now, obviously, it's early reports, but you know, Sorovakin, who is the commanding general in the south, um, probably one of the best generals the Russians have, um, has sort of disappeared from view. There are now reports that you know, he's been arrested. Um, we're still waiting for more detail on that, but that is the sort of thing we're expecting as Russia starts to clean house following this. Um, and certainly there were enough warnings, I think, from within the system in Russia that Wagner were unhappy, this was known, that they were likely to do something. They've been stockpiling arms and equipment for quite a period of time. And I think either people let it go because they didn't know what to do about it um, or because they wanted to see where this went. But I think it was a very uncontrolled situation. And for Lukashenko to bail Putin out uh, is not entirely credible. So we feel there are other players here. And Putin is at the top of the regime. He's not in control. I think he's become the figurehead much more. And there are lots of players underneath that who are probably saying what happens if the campaign in Ukraine doesn't go well, what next after Putin? And so he's got to deal with that situation. He's really out the front just as a big head at this point. And that's what this shows. Let's look at the war, because Prigozhin's combatants were some of the most ruthless, but also the most effective forces yes. that Russia had at its disposal. What does it mean for the war that they're now off the battlefield? Well, I mean, they were off anyway. They got pulled back after Bakhmut was captured, the city itself. Um, and I think their numbers were much reduced. There were lots of inflated figures going around about how many they were. But you may recall they brought a lot of people out of the prisons. Um, they were using a lot of people almost as cannon fodder. They had a system whereby the most elite people would stay back, the weakest people would go to the front. And so the elite people probably survived longer, lived longer, were probably the people in the columns that headed to Moscow on Saturday. Um, but there's a few thousand of them probably at this point at most. And their future remains unclear. They were told they had the choice of going to exile in Belarus, um, or join the army in Russia. Now, I don't think any of them would want to be in the Russian regular army, otherwise they'd have joined it in the first place. Right. And they may not be popular in the army because the army is very divided about whether they're supporting or against Wagner. So regardless, those, those forces are largely lost, I think, to the war effort. But it's a price perhaps the Kremlin's been willing to pay in exchange for getting rid of the political problem that this private army was developing for them. Yeah. What can... Ukraine do to seize the moment, this chaos that seems to be going on in Moscow? Well, they've certainly, they jumped on this straight away. Um, there wasn't enough time, I think, of real chaos in the bit where the Russians were fighting each other for Ukraine to make great gains at that point. 
Uh, but they did push forward on the battlefield that day, and I think they knew that Russian morale would be very hurt by what was going on, of course, if there's chaos behind you um, and one of your best fighting units is fighting other parts of your army. You don't really want to waste your life in that situation. Um, so Ukraine did push hard on Saturday. They did gain some, some ground, but very tactically. They didn't have time to develop that situation. But, of course, now they're pushing very hard on the narrative that you know, Russia is failing. And I think more widely, Ukraine depends on Western support. And there were some fears ahead of the conference in Vilnius, just under two weeks for NATO, that um, the lack of Ukrainian gains in the battlefield might result in nations calling for negotiations or something like that. I think now, and it's very clear in the US and others, I think the, the problems inside Russia have really emboldened the nation supporting Ukraine. And that's probably the most important single thing. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned equipment, supplies, yeah. logistics are a huge factor Absolutely. in this conflict. Let's take a closer look at how big a factor that actually is and then keep talking. A key bridge for Russian supply lines into southern Ukraine. A Russian weapons dump wiped from the map. And a fuel depot in Annex Crimea, all targeted by Ukrainian forces in recent weeks, all crucial in the machinery of war. The war in Ukraine is now... Uh a war of attrition, uh, and a war of attrition uh, becomes a, a war of logistics. Historically, Russia has relied heavily on its rail network to move military cargo around. But inside Ukraine, destroyed railways meant that wasn't possible, leaving Russia reliant on trucks to support frontline troops. One US military logistics expert estimates that Russia only has enough trucks and personnel to support a war effort up to 145 kilometers from supply dumps. Earlier this month, Russia's exasperated defense minister toured a military storage facility and told his men to get a move on. Meticulously staged visits like this are part and parcel of Russia's domestic propaganda effort. But the true test of Moscow's logistical might will be exposed on the battlefield sooner or later. Indeed. And in this battle of attrition and logistics, who has the upper hand right now? Is it Ukraine or is it Russia? Russia has long argued it does. It's, you know, the huge nation had huge stockpiles of Soviet equipment. Um, but, of course, the campaign to support Ukraine has been solid. Uh, they've received pretty good donations of vehicles, clearly, and we've seen that. And although they've taken losses of those vehicles in offensive action, which you would expect, the donations they're getting through are pretty much replacing those straight away. Mm. It'll take a little bit of time, but they're certainly making good the losses. And I think we talked before about this being an artillery conflict, and when you watch the footage, you see how much of this is the guns firing uh, on targets and how important that is for both sides. And what's interesting in this phase is that Ukraine has really... Um, focus its attention on destroying Russian artillery. So whenever Ukraine attacks, they force the Russians to fire their guns. When you fire your guns, you have to bring them out of the woods, you have to bring them out of cover, and they're exposed to drones, they're exposed to other forms of attack. And if you look at the rates claimed by Ukraine, you can ignore the absolute numbers because they're always uncertain, but the, the trend of claims and artillery losses on the Russian side by Ukraine um, is definitely escalating. And I think it shows the success they've had in that piece of this, and that's very important at this stage. The other part of making guns stop firing at you is to make sure they have no ammunition. Mm -hmm. And this is where these longer range strikes using particularly Storm Shadow missile, but others as well, um, have been very effective in uh, reducing Russian ammunition supplies for their artillery. Um, it'll never reduce it absolutely, but it all helps. And it's this combined effort across the Russian logistics and command control layout in southern Ukraine that will give the Ukrainians an advantage over time if they can maintain the pace. And they've done this before, they did this exact same sort of campaign outside Kherson and indeed to an extent outside Kyiv well over a year ago now. And looking back on what happened over the weekend, all these chaotic events, uh, there was a moment where the Wagner Group was in control of the military command centre in Rostov-on-Don. How much of a disruption can that cause to Russia's military efforts, even if it was only for a couple of hours? I think still, I mean, the most significant element of that still is the morale effect. Um, and I think that that is a shock for the Russian military. It split them about whether they supported the action or don't, and it's created uncertainty and confusion. I think when they actually walked into the command post, uh, they were pretty much unopposed, which tells you something in itself. 
um, and they allowed operations to continue under their observation, but they tried not to fear, uh, interfere in any way with the, the, the effort of the war that was going on. So I don't think that in itself was significant. I think it's a shock that that could be taken over as easily. Um, and now, of course, the loss of senior commanders. And I think it's the uncertainty and that loss of command, the confusion about who's going to be in command, especially if Sorovakin is gone, that will really plague the Russian army for the next few weeks. And Ukraine will press hard in that time. They will press hard, but how long can they press? Because time, is often said, is on Russia's side because yeah. they have a numerical advantage. Wouldn't they benefit from this becoming a very dragged out conflict? It's certainly what Russia wants. And I think the, one of the reasons they're fighting for every inch of ground, and in defense, you don't have to do that. You can give up ground, you can withdraw, draw your enemy out and, and counterattack them eventually. But Russia's counterattacking straight away if they lose any ground. And that's very wasteful for Russia. They're losing a lot of troops needlessly doing that. And I think it's because they're desperate to hold on to what they have. I think that's what it tells us. And they're hoping if they can just limit Ukrainian gains, sit there and scare Western backers of Ukraine, that eventually um, drive us to stop supporting Ukraine, to call for an end where things are now. So I think Russia feels it can push for time. I'm not sure we're going to give way as quickly as Russia thinks, especially after what's happened there over the weekend. Yeah. Is NATO doing all it can? I feel like I've asked you this many yeah, times. We discuss this every week. Um, <laughs> NATO's not doing everything it could, but it's doing an awful lot, and it's getting a lot of things to Ukraine when it needs them. The deficiency has been air power, and one of the reasons this is hard going for the Ukrainians in the south is that lack of um, air dominance. Now, the Russians don't have it either, but it would certainly be easier going for Ukraine with a lot more aircraft, which is why they've been asking for them, and one of the reasons they've been asking for them for so long. It looks like they will eventually get them. Probably too late to help the campaign over this summer, but if things do extend, that will start to really provide them with some help in due course. Better late than never. That was military analyst Justin Crump. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you.